Today, we are most privileged to have with us Dr. Mark Van Ness from the Workwell Foundation in California and a professor at the Pacific University. It is clear from talking with him last night that he really understands what we're up against and what we're intending to do. He has traveled many places in the world and talked with people such as us, and he knows the story thoroughly, and he has some very reliable, science-based stuff to tell us. And in the second half, which is the uh, second half of the agenda, he will talk more about uh, specific things that you can each aspire to to make yourself less ill. So, Mark. Um, thanks, Larry, for the introduction. Um, we did have a nice time chatting last night. Um, I think it's always interesting to hear a story like Larry tells of his daughter because each uh, of us that deals with somebody that has ME or our own story of ME informs um, what we do in research. And if it doesn't inform what we do in research, something's wrong with our research agenda. So I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate you guys all coming out here on a Sunday. Um, hopefully we all can learn a little bit um, from each other as we go through here. Um, I'd just like to, to thank Elizabeth for putting this together. Um, Jill, Jill Pasco set up a, a time that I got to meet with the, um, the CCDP program. Um, it's very encouraging to hear what you guys have going here. And then, of course, Larry, for the nice introduction. Um, the, uh, I put up here just a list of um, my collaborators. Uh, Stacy had the opportunity to come up here last year and speak with you guys. Um, and then uh, Dr. Snell, I've worked with Dr. Snell for the last 17 years. He's retired from the university, but can't retire from MECFS research. So we're keeping him involved um, any way we can. And then um, uh, Todd Davenport and Jared have helped. Um, I, I, I don't want to uh, underestimate the uh, wealth of information that we've gotten from people that are volunteering for our studies because we couldn't do it um, without them. Um, and saying that, uh, I want to describe a little bit because uh, I think this is important for all of us to understand. Every researcher that you'll listen to or every physician that you'll meet probably has a bias. Um, and when a researcher says they don't have a bias, be very careful because they don't recognize it. Um, I want to share my bias with you so that you know the research that I'm going to share with you guys. You understand the perspective that I come from um, so you can embrace the research in the appropriate context. So. Um, all of the research I'm going to show you is uh, from ME subjects that have done exercise tests. So sometimes they've volunteered, sometimes they've been recruited, sometimes um, they're needing disability evaluations. And so we use, we ask if we can use that data as part of our studies. So you guys all understand this probably represents uh, only a proportion of people that have um, ME. Uh, it certainly, it excludes people that could not take part in an exercise test. They couldn't even get to the clinic um, because they're bedridden. Um, so those, those probably um, are not well expressed in this research. So um, certainly when you look at some of these findings, just understand they're coming from higher functioning uh, MECFS patients. So a little bit about um, how I got into this. I, I started being drawn into the role of exercise testing in describing ME um, with the amplogen studies and uh, the, the pharmaceutical company uh, Amplogen was looking at wanting to do a clinical trial to see if their drug improved physical function, and so uh, they used exercise testing as part of that. that the, a lot of the data I'm going to show you started from that and has um, arisen from that over time. Um, and then we have uh, an ongoing interest uh, here in uh, my, my background in exercise physiology. Todd Davenport is a physical therapist trying to come up with strategies to prevent a lot of the deconditioning detraining, secondary uh, depression, muscle atrophy, um, hypokinetic diseases that uh, go along with uh, having MECFS. So I'll share some of those findings as well. Um, my research bias embraces post-exertional malaise. Um, you'll, you'll hear me say oftentimes that 
Post-exertional malaise, or just PEM, is a hallmark symptom, uh, is a cardinal symptom. We feel like it's an important description of the disease. It's, it's a post-exertional exacerbation of symptoms, and I think it's one thing that makes ME uh, very different than other diseases. Um, I embrace the, the Canadian case consensus and the, the Institute of Medicine um, use post-exertional malaise a lot, so you'll hear me talking about that um, much later on. Um, this is my goal for today, and I want to want to tell you what my goal is so you can kind of embrace where we're going and why we're doing it the way we are. Um, I want to pre present some of my research findings, and then with each of the findings that we found in, in research, what those mean for therapeutic interventions. So why is it that pacing works so well? Why is it that, uh, that Mark Van Ness says aerobic conditioning doesn't work as well as other people would? So um, I'm going to share the findings with you. And, and the idea here is I'm trying to get you to buy into why it works. Um, you can have somebody tell you you should do this or you should do that. Um, what I'm hoping to do is describe the why, and each individual has um, their own unique illness. If you can understand the pathology of the illness, maybe you can understand better what's wrong and then go towards a, a progressing to how that can be lessened or ameliorated. So um, recovery from fatigue. Whenever anyone experiences fatigue, whether it's somebody that's had a long day at work, a hard workout, or has chronic fatigue syndrome, the prescription is you need to recover from the fatigue. So the prescription is intense rest. I've heard people describe that. What do you need to recover? Well, you need intense rest. Um, you need to allow your body time to heal. What's the problem with ME is uh, the fatigue is unrelenting. Um, and, and you have compounded problems of unrefreshing sleep. Normally, sleep is where you get the, the most healing and recovery. Uh, and clearly, you can't spend all of your time recovering because if you spend too much time recovering, you end up with um, what they call hospital-acquired deconditioning. So, and, and that's simply muscle atrophy, secondary depression, uh, things that go with not being active. So how do we balance the need for rest and recovery with the need to do physical activity so you can maintain normal physiological function. It certainly is a challenge and we're gonna see if we can attack that uh, this way. Understand what is the problem and then pro progress from, if this is the problem, how can we come to a solution? And I'm gonna use two examples here. Uh, one of the problems is post-exertional malaise. I'm gonna try to describe from a research perspective how post-exertional malaise is uh, described objectively as well as subjectively. And then once you understand what post-exertional malaise is, how can we take day-to-day -day activities that avoid the post-exertional exacerbations? Uh, this is the patient experience with things like exercise training or energy conservation. How can we identify things like cues that precede a crash so that these can be avoided? And the, the goal here is um, these are ideas to help live a more productive life and avoid future exacerbations. Um, the other is, is just the problem of running out of energy. It was interesting to, I, I've talked with physical therapists before, but people talk about having a given amount, a set given amount of energy. We call it an energy envelope. How can that envelope be expanded? How can you fit as much as possible of your life within that energy um, envelope? And hopefully by understanding some of the difficulties with aerobic metabolism, we can try to expand that energy uh, envelope, um, pacing activities, energy conservation therapy, and the like. I know you guys have heard a lot about that. All I'm trying to do is inform that a little bit better with the research. So again, post-exertional malaise, PAM, um, we, we've seen this. I, I mentioned the, the Canadian uh, case description. The, the physical or mental exertion causes depilitating fatigue. Um, the Institute of Medicine, uh, unfortunately, they added the systemic exertional intolerance disorder, which is, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it helps clarify um, or muddies the water more, but certainly this idea of post-exertional malaise is the patient experience. Um, it's a, a hallmark of the disease. How can we characterize it and then set about ways to lessen that effect? Uh, here's what I do. Um, to accurately characterize post-exertional malaise, you induce it. And so you, you utilize exercise stress to, over here it says, induces a consistent post-exertional response. 
uh, it's very difficult to do that because there's things like mental, emotional, physical, psychological events that can cause a post-exertional response. We use physical stress, which comprises some of the other domains as well, um, to usually we, we think it, it exerts a, a fairly robust immune response that causes post-exertional malaise in subsequent days. Um, if you, some people use the good day, bad day phenomena, which I think is helpful in describing the disease. Doing an exercise stress actually produces a consistent post-exertional response. So as detrimental as it may sound, it is helpful for research. And then um, trying to measure some of the functionality during the exercise stress is informative of the pathology. Um, so I'll go over a few of these, but I just wanted to show you what this looks like. This is a typical exercise uh, um, probably a, a cardiopulmonary uh, exercise test or CPET. Um, and this is the, the patient on a bicycle ergometer. The bicycle ergometer is convenient because it measures work output. So you get an objective measure of capability of work output. Um, measuring blood pressure allows you to look at redistribution of blood flow. Are the autonomic responses working well? To shunt blood away from the gut, getting blood to active muscles. Um, the ECG electrodes measure the rate and rhythmicity and perfusion of the heart. And this is important because I've heard people describe ME as heart disease in the absence of heart disease. Some of the manifestations are like heart disease, but the patient doesn't have the same risk factors. And then what we rely a lot on is um, the metabolic data. Um, the difference between the air that's breathed in and the air that's breathed out tells you about how much oxygen is being utilized and how much CO2 is being produced. And what you can gather from an exercise test like this is partly the post-exertional response, which I'll start from, and then we'll start to look more at some of the cardiac and pulmonary effects later on. So just in terms of PEM, this was some of my introduction um, to what ME was. It was amazing how long it takes someone to recover from an exercise test. Uh, if you have uh, a normal, quote, normal but sedentary person do an exercise test, it's stressful, it hurts, it's hard to do, it, it makes your muscles sore afterwards. But look, they recover very, very quickly. Almost all the control subjects recover within like a day, sometimes two. Um, in this first study, and these were fairly high-functioning um, subjects with ME, they did, they, their average recovery time was like four days. Um, which is an odd response, um, certainly. Um, we've looked at this more. This is a study with, that Todd's done that we were clearly able to discriminate between a subject that had ME and a subject that didn't have ME based on their recovery response. So clearly, post-exertional malaise describes well um, the, the patient's response. I like to show this um, because this is, this is a, what's called a post-exertional or post-exercise questionnaire. Um, some of the questions we ask, you know, is things like, how did you feel after the first test? How did you feel after the second test? How did you feel day after? How long did it take you to recover? It's a little bit cut off here on the bottom, but this questionnaire is from a control subject. And after doing back-to-back -back exercise tests, they said, how do you feel? Great. You know, a little, a little sore. I was tired. I recovered within the day. Do you, do you see the, the numbers of descriptions? They said, I was a little bit tired. Compare that to a typical ME patient. What they're describing here is an exacerbation of their symptoms. And it's important to have available lines for them to write how they feel, not you know, a prescribed ranking. Um, we've taken some of these um, to try to describe better some of the, the subjective symptoms. And I want to use those subjective symptoms because they're, again, they're the, they're the patient perspective. But are there objective outcome measures that we can also garner that um, like I, I've heard clinicians sometimes say, um, you get an ME patient and you feel like they've read the internet. They know the lines that they're supposed to say. And sometimes that provides skepticism for healthcare providers. But at the same time, there are objective measures that you can get from an exercise test. And we can look at some of those. Uh, here's subjective symptoms. I think some of you have probably seen this, but it's very interesting. Um, this is just a list. It's kind of small, but a list of nine symptoms. So things like fatigue, lightheadedness, uh, cognitive problems, malaise, uh, insomnia, you know, immune problems. Uh, and then the, the colors here, immediately after doing exercise, and then in the days following. This is a, a group of 20 control subjects. And what you see is some of them complain of the symptoms in the dark bars right after the exercise test. 
but then you see that the bars go to close to zero in subsequent days. They recover fast. Compare that to this group of CFS patients. They experience similar symptoms after the exercise test, but instead of going down in the days subsequently, they're actually going up. That's, that's very odd. You, you don't continually get worse uh, after doing a bout of exercise in, uh, in control subjects. Here you're seeing an amplification of symptoms, it, even immune things in the days subsequent. So this is a, a very good description of when a CFS patient says they've crashed. Um, this is what they're experiencing. Those are subjective symptoms that are very, very meaningful. I like to use this analogy of taking your car to a mechanic and telling them what's wrong. And you can tell them, well, when I get up to 55, it shakes and they listen. They may have some skepticisms. So what does a mechanic do? They take your car out for a drive. Um, and actually taking the car out, letting it go, they experience, they see, feel the symptoms. It's the same with an exercise test. Um, when you take the system outside its normal you know, resting state, there, there can be some things that are revealing, and I want to share those. So um, for, before I share some of those things, and I'm going to put them in three highlighted categories, I want to share this. There's a lot of heterogeneity uh, in the exercise test data, and I think that reflects the pathology of the illness. It's a very, very heterogeneous um, sort of thing. Different symptom complexes in different patients, and the, the CCDP was talking about how you have to treat each patient individual like its own case study. Um, we have uh, high-functioning patients, low-functioning patients. Um, we have wondered a lot about some of these differences uh, due to how long they've had the illness, the magnitude of the illness, different pathologies that are going on. I can illustrate that with, with this. This is, a, this is using our American Medical Association guidelines for functional impairment. And they have four categories, not impaired, mild, moderate, and severely impaired. When we did exercise tests on somewhere around 200 subjects, it was interesting the degree of functional impairment that a lot of the patients showed. But up here, you can see a small proportion of those actually showed al almost no functional impairment. Is it the same illness? Is it a magnitude of the illness? Are we not capturing it very well looking at a single exercise test? But certainly, just going back for a second, there is heterogeneity. We need to recognize that whenever we approach the illness as a whole. But just in terms of the exercise response, um, this is showing an individual going from a resting state to an exercise state. And it shows all of the different systems that have to enhance their capability to allow that person to do physical activity. And, and physical activity like walking or uh, shopping or washing dishes or taking a shower or something like that. Um, and I just want to highlight some of the, there's, there's actually three of them here that I'm going to show data from exercise studies that shows impairment at different levels. Impairment with your ability to exchange air, um, an impaired uh, ability for the heart rate to rise to deliver blood to active tissues. Um, the, the, I don't have data today on the, the blood pressure responses, but I think the, uh, the abnormalities in redistribution of blood flow, like taking blood away from your guts, shuttling it out to muscles and in particular to your brain uh, during stress can be a challenge. Um, and then all of these systems um, combined have to, uh, to be called upon to produce a metabolic response. So this is, this is what I'm going to try to do for this first part. Um, what systems, when we look back at this big chart, what systems do we show evidence of impairment? Um, and we'll go through these. The metabolic system, the cardiovascular system, and the pulmonary system all show degrees of impairments. So let's just go through one by one. Let's start with the metabolic system. Um, look at the, the combined capability of the metabolic system, what's wrong, and then how can that influence or that be lessened um, to uh, increase quality of life. When we talk about um, metabolic systems, um, basically in like exercise science, you talk about three different systems. We're going to talk about two main energy generating systems. There's, there's the aerobic system, which when you think of aerobic metabolism, most people think of aerobic activity, like walking and jogging and swimming and things like that. But the aerobic system is the one that you use to maintain your posture. M most of your postural muscles are aerobic in nature. The ones that you use to walk and do low-level exercise are primarily aerobic. Um, a lot of times people think of anaerobic metabolism or the glycolytic system as a more short-term system. 
where the aerobic system is highly efficient, the anaerobic or glycolytic system is less efficient. Um, when you think of long-term metabolism, the, the CO2 that's produced is the byproduct that's simply exhaled. And in other words, it's a, it's a very uh, clean burning system. Um, lactic acid, which is obviously op oftentimes viewed negatively, is the aerobic system. Um, if you buy into some of the data I'm going to show you today, it's going to show you that this aerobic system is damaged. And uh, it's going to limit this long-term, low-intensity exercise or physical activity. If you recognize the system as being damaged and try to learn how to live life using the anaerobic or retraining the anaerobic system, you may be able to um, lessen disease severity. And here's a way to illustrate that. Um, I, I, the, the two main energy systems here is this anaerobic or short-term glycolytic system versus this more long-term, it's dark there, but that's the aerobic system. If you view this system as being impaired, it has a diminished capability. Activities that are longer than two minutes, well, those activities that are longer than two minutes, you're going to have increased risk for aggravation of functional impairment post-exertional malaise. Because you see here, after about two minutes duration, the aerobic system becomes very predominant in providing energy. If that system is impaired like it is shifted downward in this graph, you need to rely more on this short-term energy system. The short-term energy system, at least according to most of the data that I've seen, is not impaired. And so if you can live life within this capacity, you may be able things like pacing, uh, the analeptic energy, uh, or analeptic uh, exercise therapy, you may be able to do more using that system than trying to retrain a broken system. So uh, this is just a case study of a, of a marathon runner. You think of a marathon runner, they're highly aerobic. Um, this is just showing that this, this person over months and years trying to retrain their system, trying to run, trying to improve their capability. And, and basically what happens is um, it's the, they see diminished aerobic capacity week after week, month after month, despite training. Um, and I don't think this, this necessarily, this dramatic reduction in their capability here just shows um, before they had MECFS, their oxygen consumption. There's their oxygen consumption. It's, it's like their, their capability for the aerobic system is cut in half. And that's probably not just due to deconditioning, that's probably due to the pathology of the illness. In other words, the capability to get energy through aerobic activities is impaired. That's part of the pathology of the illness. Rather than try to repair a damaged system, how can we avoid that? So it does not appear that aerobic conditioning improves a damaged or broken aerobic system. So we need to revisit. Classic exercise training produces very little benefits. Um, and along with that, trying to do this type of training might exacerbate the illness. So let's just get away from that and try to avoid this post-exertional response. We've had a lot of patients that insist that they try to do aerobic conditioning and what they end up with is a consistent post-exertional response. Their life diminishes in an attempt to maintain their exercise and that's not appropriate way to live. Um, I just, I like some of these pictures. When someone describes what is post-exertional malaise, I'm laying in mud and I just can't even get up. Um, it's, uh, and, and, and just remember, sometimes the, the, the invigoration that they feel doing the exercise might feel really, really good. Um, it's still not worth it. Um, they, there's, in the long run, you know, never again, hopefully, is the, the response. So try to avoid prolonged aerobic activity. So our, our, our data on these exercise tests shows over and over aerobic capacity is diminished. Your ability to use oxygen through aerobic pathways is messed up. It gets even worse um, when you're in a post-exertional state. So try to avoid a long, prolonged aerobic activity. Walking is a very aerobic activity. Standing is a very aerobic. Your postural muscles, again, they rely on oxygen. So how do you avoid walking and standing? You try to minimize that time spent um, you can still do exercise training that avoids that. Even something as simple as activity management that, that chooses a comfortable position that doesn't exacerbate the illness. Well, some of you are already have developed strategies to do that. We'll just talk about some that might work. Showering. Showering is, bathing is a very, it's a, it's a big challenge cardiovascularly because you're in an upright posture. And that warm water ca sometimes causes venous pooling and redistribution of blood flow. So, Minimize the time in the shower, uh, certainly sit um, or, or uh, minimize the time standing. 
don't even bother drying off. Just pull on it. Some, some of you have seen these. Uh, Stacy does a good job of, of um, sharing these things. It's just trying to avoid aerobic activity. Um, simplify your clothing so you're not spending a lot of time standing or changing positions while you dress. Um, what said somebody, uh, one of the, our subjects said this, was the dry shampoo is the best thing she discovered. She spent so much time on her, on her hair. Um, uh, this, I think, is very important. Some, some people feel humiliated buying a handicap placard. It's wonderful. It might allow you more time to shop while you're in there. Um, it's, if, if you don't have to spend so much time getting from your car into wherever you're trying to go, I think it's a very, very good idea. In terms of pacing strategies, um, it sounds funny to pack your groceries strategically, but one of the things I'm going to encourage you to try to do is Get a heart rate monitor, monitor your heart rate. When you go above your anaerobic threshold, stop what you're doing. That can be very irritating when you're not used to it because you might have a pile of groceries that need to be put away and you feel like you just want to get it done, yet while you're doing it, you're exceeding your anaerobic threshold heart rate. Pack things so that you can put your freezer or refrigerator goods away and maybe allow yourself to take a break and come back to it later. Um, it might be surprising how well you can do things if you learn the some of the strategies, um, answering machines. Um, this one seems to be helpful um, for a lot of people, not getting up to grab the remote, not running into the other room to get your knitting or your book or things like that. Put it all in a little basket and just take it wherever you're going. It avoids the changes in position that may limit the amount of um, energy that you have available to do the things that you want throughout a day. Um, if you've watched, if, you know, simple things like walking around the bed back and forth to, to put it together. It's an upright posture. It's aerobic activity. Try to make your bed while you're, while you're laying down. Laying down seems to be a really good posture. Uh, not a lot of venous pooling, less orthostatic problems, better brain function. The more you can do in a laying down position will allow some of that limited energy availability uh, to be used elsewhere. Um, a lot of people enjoy cooking. They don't want to give up cooking. Um, so they like to cook good meals. If you're going to cook a good meal, make it so they can be used several times. Uh, having things like a, a, a stool to sit on, having a place of, available close to where you cook, where you can do a bit and then recover, um, might allow you to do more. In general, what you're trying to do is avoid prolonged aerobic activity and instead favoring shorter bursts of activity that utilize this glycolytic system. That's the system that maintains its capability. It doesn't seem to be as affected by the illness. So in terms of pacing strategies, what you're trying to do is use that shorter term system. Um, we, had a, we had a subject once in a study. She lived in a third floor apartment. So getting out of her apartment was, was it, it, almost never. She could get down to go do things, but that, those three flights of stairs were just killer on the way home. She found if she had a chair on each of uh, the landings, she could go up one flight, sit down, recover, let her heart rate come back down below her AT, walk up the next flight of stairs. She said it's monotonous to get used to, but it expanded her energy envelope. She could do it on a much more regular basis. In other words, it works. Um, can, I, can I tell you guys a little story? Um, my... Uh, my students, uh, we do this uh, weight loss program for community weight loss. And basically, you guys know how it goes. You tell them to eat less and exercise more, right? Um, one of the students once asked me, how come they don't do it? You know, and, and it's, it, it sounds like a, such a silly question, but it's the same kind of thing. We know this works. You probably know that it's worked. I'm going to use one of my friends named Joan McParlin. Um, she knows how to use her heart rate monitor. She knows that when it beeps, she's supposed to talk. She just doesn't want to. She's got stuff to do. Um, and and it's, it's the training that can be difficult. That's why you need to get your, uh, <laughs> yeah, you need to get your significant other on board. So when they hear your alarm go off, they enable you to sit down and recover. So um, at least try it. So, all right. So that's, that's the metabolic system. Um, kind of the, the metabolic system impairment and recognizing that that's impaired, how can you move on to try to avoid uh, utilizing an impaired system? The second one here is the cardiovascular system. And the cardiovascular system, when you think of that, it's your heart, it's your blood and your blood vessels. I'm going to share some of the data um, on chronotropic incompetence. In other words, it, that's just a fancy word to say your heart rate doesn't go up as much as you would expect when you do physical activity. What's that mean? Less blood flow. 
less blood flow to your brain, less blood flow to muscles, and then what's the outcome of that? And if that's a problem that you can have difficult time repairing, how in life can you get around that? So this is a description of what is chronotropic incompetence. So chrono, you know, as in the, the, the pacing of your heart, incompetence, it's a failure or it's an inability of your heart rate to rise commensurate with physical activity. So if you do a little activity, your heart rate comes up a little bit. If you do a lot of activity, it's supposed to go up a lot. This is common in cardiovascular disease, and it's recognized in cardiovascular disease that it produces exercise intolerance like ME-CFS. It impairs quality of life like it does in, in ME-CFS. And I'm just going to use a picture to illustrate this. So this is showing someone's heart rate. Um, these are subjects in these exercise studies. This is a, a control subject. This is a group of like 50 or 30 control subjects, 50 or 60 CFS subjects. The, the ME-CFS patients have a higher resting heart rate. And then this shows how much their heart rises to the anaerobic threshold. And most people live their life between resting and anaerobic threshold. But then this illustrates rather dramatically a blunted rise in heart rate. These are the ME patients. That's how high their heart rate goes up during exercise. This is the control um, subjects. And I just box this out here to just show, we refer to this as a cardiovascular operating window. ME patients are dealing with a smaller window that their heart's capable of doing. And while that looks dramatic, can I just redraw this just a little bit? Because really, where we want to live life is below the anaerobic threshold. When you get up to an exercise intensity that starts to become very dramatic, where aerobic metabolism is very significant, you'd like to stay below that. So if you look at the difference here between resting and the anaerobic threshold heart rate, you can see that's a diminished, we call it a cardiovascular operating window. You have a more narrow activity window. So you have to tailor your activities to stay within that window. Um, control subjects without that impairment obviously have a much bigger range that they're capable of doing before they hit their anaerobic threshold. So um, what does this show us? This, there's good evidence of chronotropic incompetence in ME patients. Um, and basically what this means is there's a pathology in the heart rate response that you can reveal by doing exercise. Um, I don't have the data here. I'll have it at our IACFS meeting in October. It shows, um, you guys have probably heard of the two-day exercise test. When someone does that second day of exercise where they still haven't recovered from the first day, the, the problem with chronotropic incompetence is even worse. So there you have a, a small operating window um, with the first exercise test. It can be even more diminished after the second exercise test. So the question is, how do you deal with this? Um, how do you try to uh, get around this? This is just a single case study of somebody that uses their heart rate, even as diminished as it is, staying within their operating window allows them to do more. So the, the little pacing strategy that uses heart rate before, a lot of times this subject had a really hard time doing something as simple as washing dishes, you know, less than five minutes. They, they couldn't, they had a post-exertional response that lasted into the next day. Um, you know, going to see their doctor was such a stress that oftentimes they'd have post-exertional malaise for several days, even stretching outward to a week, so a week's recovery from the doctor's visit. And then other activities were all but impossible. Learning to operate within that cardiovascular operating window, getting a heart rate monitor, using the heart rate monitor, listening to it, uh, they found they, they used the expression, they were able to do more with less. If we go back and you view that window over there, they have less, but they learn to operate within that they are able to do more. Uh, and sometimes that means pacing while they wash the dishes. Um, getting ready, for instance, they recover, make sure their heart rate's at a very low range, um, and then do the activity, then return and rest again. They can get stuff done as long as they're willing to... Uh, to uh, we had a subject one time say, I, I play with the cards I'm dealt with, and uh, I, I learned to become content with that. Um, and it can be uh, a success story. Um, remember these patients aren't going out and doing 10Ks like they were before, but they are having uh, happiness and fulfilling parts of their life that are restored. So how do you do this? You guys have probably seen this before. If you have not, 
get yourself a heart rate monitor. Um, the, the Fitbits are, are good. We like to encourage people to get the Fitbit if they're going to get that. Get the one that has the heart rate with it. I've used an Epson watch before that doesn't have the chest strap. Um, it gives good feedback on heart rate. And uh, if you haven't done an exercise test, you might not know what your anaerobic threshold heart rate is. So start something conservatively. Start at a, at a heart rate of 100. Um, program the Polar uh, heart rate monitors allow you to program it so that an alarm will go off when you hit 100. Listen to that alarm. When it goes off, you're above your anaerobic threshold. Stop what you're doing. Rest, recover. Let your heart rate come back down. Once it's recovered, we'll do some breathing exercises and then um, resume that activity. Try to stay within that, that more narrow operating window. So um, the, the, most of the people have, have enjoyed the Polar monitors. Um, they make one uh, that fits inside uh, just for comfort's sake. Uh, it takes a little while to get used to. Some people never get used to the The wrist-mounted ones, I think, have less reliability than the, than the chest strap. Have, have you, you, you guys used a heart rate monitor before? Um, if, if you haven't, you got to try it. Um, it, it. You might hate the damn thing because it restricts what you do. After a while, you'll fall in love with the, the, the pacing. It frees you up to say, I need to stop, and now I can go again. Um, it's very, very helpful if you are going to do an exercise program to stay below your AT. Um, you need to recognize that um, what are real values. And, and actually, we talked about this with the, the CCC, CCDP folks. Um, I, I used a microwave as an example. That's kind of goofy. But um, recognize sometimes emotional things can cause your heart rate to rise. Um, be aware of that. That's an extra stress that's in addition to the physical stress. Um, if that's occurring, still use your cutoff. Um, you, know, you just want, want that capability you know, to, to recognize what's real versus what's purely physical, purely emotional. Um, you'll probably find there's times of days that are better for you to do activities. Oftentimes, mornings are more challenging than early afternoon. The things you want to get done, if you can uh, work around that. Um, we encourage people to uh, keep an activity log. And um, it's, some people hate doing this. Some people embrace it. Um, it's a nice thing to look back at. And, and I'm just showing you an example here of a morning, 8 o'clock, eat breakfast, 8.30, do dishes, take a shower, and then rest and recover. There's a period of time, if this person had an AT of 100, what they'll recognize is some of these activities, they, they appear to be able to do well, whereas some of these other activities produce a post-exertional response. And if you're above your anaerobic threshold, this is under AT, for both of those activities, they're above their anaerobic threshold, interestingly enough, also in an upright posture, they can be more difficult to recover from. Um, we're using the, this is the Borg scale of rating perceived exertion. It's kind of a funny scale because it goes from six, no activity, up to 20 being maximal activity. And it sounds, you know, on a scale of six to 20, that's what it is. But in healthy people, this can correspond to their heart rate. If you add a zero, a heart rate of 60 would be like nothing. A heart rate somewhere around 100, we call this the yellow zone. This is where you start to have some caution that you may be exceeding your anaerobic threshold and you might want to back off a little bit. Green, you're good to go. Yellow, there's some caution there. You really want to avoid being in this range that causes an exacerbation. So you can see the rating of perceived exertion here was above that 10 to 12, and it usually ends up producing a post-exertional response. So heart rate doesn't lie. Listen to your heart rate. It's never wrong um, or often correct in helping you guide your activities. And certainly in terms of pacing, it can help. Um, and then at the very end uh, of this, we're going to talk about um, doing exercise. And it's, it's very important to use your uh, heart rate as uh, a measure of whether you've recovered well or not. So just very quickly, red zone, stay out of it. It's, it's going to be hell to pay like the lady who runs the red light. You're going to pay for that later on. Um, try to stay out of that, that red zone. Uh, the yellow zone, and this is usually where your heart rate uh, monitor is telling you. Uh, it's beeping. You're in that yellow zone. Um, this is the be very careful zone. Sometimes, like for instance, if you're walking from one place to another, you have something you absolutely need to get done, you will exceed your anaerobic threshold. Stop, rest, and recover um, whenever you possibly can. And that, that green zone is you are good to go. Um, 
it's, it's surprising if you keep your heart rate down below that. Um, you'll probably have days where you're going to exceed the, the green zone very, very easily. You do need to recognize you're probably in the midst of an exacerbation, a post-exertional malaise response. And so your heart rate by virtue of that is going to be elevated. And that means you're back to intense rest um, because that's what your body needs uh, to try to recover um, at least to an extent. So, so far we've got you know, a little bit of pacing strategies. We've got a little bit of heart rate monitoring. We've got the insights that are lended from the cardiovascular exercise kind of stuff. There are other stuff that are, isn't informed well, and that's the problem with orthostasis. And you guys have seen this before. That recumbent posture seems to re, uh, alleviate this to a, a large degree, trying to uh, prevent the, the venous pooling. If you do have to be upright, compression stockings help. Uh, trying to get extra sodium uh, on board to expand blood volume. It is more than expanding blood volume, by the way. It's expanding blood volume and eating sodium that activates forebrain areas that helps restore some of the autonomic function. So it's, it's more than just volume. It's volume and salt. Um, so we could talk more about that later if you want to. Um, the implications of this are obviously some of the, the brain fog and oxygen deficit. So... Before I go on, th this is kind of where we've gone so far. The cardiovascular system, the, uh, the uh, sorry, the metabolic system up here, then the cardiovascular system. After we take a break, I'm just going to finish up with a little bit on the pulmonary system and then try to transition into some of what we call analeptic exercise. You guys have heard of aerobic exercise, you know, and, and exercise training and stuff like that. The, the word aerobic oftentimes conjures up fear if you have an impaired aerobic system. I like to use the term analeptic. That means exercise that's restorative, exercise that makes your functional capacity improve. That's what we'll finish up with. But it's, uh, it's 2.45 right now. So um, where's Elizabeth? Is it a couple of minutes of uh, questions? Is that okay? Okay. Yes, yes. I think this is on. Hello? Yes. Uh, Sometimes when I'm going on a short walk wearing my heart rate monitor, my legs will seize up like I'm doing deadlifts to fail dead but like I'm doing dead lifts to failure. But my heart rate is still under my um, uh, aerobic threshold of 116. It makes finding my energy envelope boundaries difficult to find. Is this the blunted heart rate phenomenon? If so, how do I tackle the issue? <laughs> That's a hard one. You guys get the, 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 the idea of the question is, I just said, watch your heart rate, watch your heart rate, watch your heart rate, but beware of other symptoms um, and, and the heaviness and the legs may be indicative. It, the, you're your own case study. There's probably no one else like you. I know your parents told you that, but um, in, terms of, <laughs> in terms of your pathology, you do have to, to try. Who asked that question, by the way? Yeah, you do need to find what cues oftentimes lead to the exacerbation. Um, for some, they'll feel themselves getting fuzzy. Others, they'll feel heaviness. Um, some, it's uh, it, it, the pain. Some, it's swollen glands. And it's, it's those preceding cues. And that's sometimes why an activity, just a log can be helpful um, to recognize what symptoms for you are indicative that you're, you're pushing it too far. Um, it'd be very interesting to know if the, the heavy leg phenomena led to a post-exertional response, or is it something that you can actually recover from? Um, it's, it's difficult, so use the heart rate, but don't be blind to other things. I think would be a good answer to that, yeah. Other questions? Okay, her, her question's about hypoglycemia, and that's, to, to me, I love the autonomic system, and, and it, there's, there's a lot of data that shows the autonomic system, which is responsible for part of the chronotropic response, is impaired. So if that's impaired, there's a feed-forward mechanism called hepatic glucose production that, as you start doing activity, maintains blood glucose. If it's impaired to the heart, it is logical that it would be impaired to the liver as well. Um, we've only done one study where we've looked at that, and it didn't seem like it was very dramatic, but we may not have done enough physical activity. So the resulting hypoglycemia from activity could be part of the autonomic response. 
So again, how do you get around that? You ingest carbohydrate before the activity. So do you have some being absorbed from your gut if there is impaired? It's, it's a very insightful question that, that comprises some of the pathology too, yeah. Any more questions that you want read out for you? Down there. Uh, you mentioned about heart rate monitors and it, and also I thought you mentioned the polar, the, the two brands. So requiring the version that just doesn't track steps. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think. Can you repeat the question. Oh yeah, the the, the questions about the Fitbit. Polar, any of these activity monitoring, whether it's on a, uh, a cell phone or an uh, activity watch or something like that, get one that monitors heart rate. That's really the answer to that. There, there is one version of the Fitbit that monitors heart rate. Um, the Epson watch was the one that I used that did a good job. Uh, I don't like the band. Um, the, 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 the band that goes around your chest gives the best reading, and that's the one from Polar. Um, I think Garmin makes one as well. Um, the reason I like, I, I, I'm, I'm not sponsored by Polar, but um, the, uh, it has that alarm on it that tells you, you know, you can set it so that it'll go off. The Garmin one, you can mess with the settings to get it to give you an audible alarm, but that feedback is good. Um, it, not the least of which you can look down and it'll say 105 and you're like, oh, I think I can push it, you know, but when that alarm keeps going off, it's a reminder to you and perhaps the people around you that it's time to take a little break and let the heart rate come back down, so, Larry. We have another question here. Oh, sorry, Larry, go ahead. So how do we find out what the anaerobic heart rate is? Good question, yeah. Uh, his question is, how do you know what your anaerobic threshold heart rate is? So the, the best answer to that would be go and do a cardiopulmonary exercise test um, because you'll know exactly what it is day one and day two. Most people aren't gonna do that. And so what you, we, we just encourage people, start out with a number that's probably a conservative number. You mentioned yours is 116. I tell people to start at 100. Um, and sometimes they get frustrated with that because like, I can't do anything. It's just the damn thing keeps going off. Um, it's just learning to deal with that. If, if they start out with 100 and they're doing really, really well, they may progress, be able to progress to 105, 110. Some people have an AT heart rate as high as 116. Some people it's as low as 100. So if you don't have a reliable exercise test, start out with 100, see how it goes. Um. Thank you. I have two questions here. Uh, one is, I tried a heart rate monitor and the thing beeped constantly with <laughs> set heart rate of 100. I am 64, how to adjust heart rate to be careful yet functional and not be too limited and depressed? And then wow. the other question was to do with the heart rate, best heart rate monitor to use, but I think you just answered that one. Um, this is what the question's complaining about. My window is narrow and it's frustrating. Uh, and my answer would be yes, it's very frustrating. Um, I, and I don't know of pharmacological interventions that can help with that. Um, I don't have anything better to add than the recognition that it's narrow and staying within that minimizes the post-exertion response. Prolonged time above that produces an exacerbation. Um, have, you, have you heard of people, they like to live on the roller coaster. They push and they crash and they deal with it. They push and they crash and they deal with it. This is a much more modest response. It's the, it may be a bit more like the tortoise, um, but it works. Uh, so, at least give it a shot. That would be my answer to that. Yes? Sometimes some of us have AFib as part of this thing and then are put on medication to suppress heart rate or to control heart rate that actually reduces heart rate. And I'm not clear of the interaction between that kind of medication and what you're telling us now. Yeah, um, so her question, obviously, is AFib, um, same thing with postural orthostatic tachycardia. You give medications to blunt the heart rate response um, because that's a, a separate and distinct pathology. It probably, it's protective of the heart, but probably exacerbates the problem you have with physical capability. Um, 
I, I don't have a good answer other than this diminished cardiovascular operating window is, is not just a problem with the pathology, but a problem with the medication that's at least treating a portion of it. And, and that's, that's not surprising. It can be even more difficult to manage. That's a, that's a horrible question, but it's the truth. No. I have another question here. Just we'll turn this person in first. Um, my aerobic system is not fully damaged. I can tolerate one run for 10 minutes once a week, sometimes twice per week, will give me PEM. Aerobic exercise once a week uh, improves some symptoms when I don't get PEM. Should I continue doing limited aerobic exercise or should I stop completely? Did you guys all hear that question okay? Um, the, the, the questions, it's a really, really good one. And one of the final thoughts I'm going to leave you with at the end of our analeptic uh, exercise therapy program is effective exercise is what you recover from. If you're doing a bout of exercise that your body's not recovering from, it's producing a post exertion response, it's not restorative, it's not healthy. So if they're capable of the one run per week, outstanding, keep going as much as you possibly can, recognizing, like she said, the two days a week was something that she couldn't recover from. Probably getting a lot of benefits from that one 10 minute bout of physical activity, uh, both emotionally and physically, um, but then recognizing, do it as long as it's productive. When it becomes counterproductive, stop it. It's not good for you, um, even if it feels good in the moment. It's a, it's a, it's a good, good question. Um, for those in the CCDP, we, that's kind of something that we talked about, you know, the, the not completely damaged aerobic system. So take advantage of what you've got, maintain it as much as possible. Yes. Both uh, the voice and the hair. So from the hair's perspective, where you uh, exert uh, crash recover. Uh, yeah, I, I, one of the problems that we all have is as we age, physical capacity goes down. That's just a natural aging process. So one way to measure success is can you maintain? So rather when you can stop the decline, the, the analogy would be in the weight loss program, stop gaining. That's, that's a measure of success. Um, if you stop the decline that normally occurs, either with the pathology or the illness, so embrace that as being a success. So your comment is, perhaps, can you improve? And I would argue strongly, yes. Probably not improve your aerobic capabilities, but certainly what you can do with the anaerobic system. And that might be low-level exercise or fits and spurts of low-level activity where you do activity recover, do some activity, because this, notice this just shows duration out here. You know, uh, the tortoise idea is good because it's low intensity, but he kept going constantly. What we may need to do with ME is do low, low level activity, recover, low level activity and recover. So that would be the only modification of your, your hair example or tortoise in the hair. So I think the answer is yes. We've seen that multiple times. I'll share some of the, uh, some of the case studies that have shown improvement um, and it's very encouraging. You got a question? Yeah, my question is around um, those that are severely ill with ME, and I know you had the caveat that yeah. the research didn't look at that, but these are people that still have to do basic functions of life, albeit from their bed. And so I'm just wondering if there's ways their, their heart rate threshold is, and, and if there isn't, then is there a heart rate that you would suggest that they use? Yeah, bed, bedridden patients, how do you adapt some of these kinds of things for them? Todd Davenport uh, has worked with bedridden patients. I have not. Um, I, I think the magnitude of the illness is more grave. 
And, and so you'd have to do the same thing with the activity monitoring, just dial it back appropriately. I've never tried the heart rate monitoring um, with somebody that's bedridden. Um, and mainly what we're interested in there is keeping their joints mobile, trying to do even you know low level stretching and strengthening, and that's all. They're pretty much bedridden. Oftentimes they'll exceed their anaerobic threshold heart rate just having someone visit them or turn on the lights or even sit upright. So it's a, it's a challenge. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. And that's, that's why I really tried to put up that bias to recognize we're talking about higher functioning ME and the magnitude of the illness in someone that's bedridden is just these by a, another order of magnitude. Do we have any other questions? Oh, yep. Yeah, this is, this is a more basic science question. What is it that causes the damage to the aerobic system? Um, so there's a lot of stuff in the literature that shows mitochondrial abnormalities, with the idea being viruses impair the mitochondria, the mitochondria is where you use oxygen, and there are abnormalities. There's fewer of them. Uh, they don't fuse the same manner. Uh, I, so that's one idea. Another idea is um, something is impaired in the mitochondria where it deals with oxidative stress uh, in an inappropriate way. And, and so all of the sequestering of hydrogen ions is messed up because of oxidative stress. Um, and then from the mitochondrial perspective, there's an oxygen delivery perspective that says the heart doesn't deliver blood uh, as well. The oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is diminished. There's less blood, less residue. All of those ideas point towards a damaged aerobic system, whether it's at the utilization end or the delivery end. Um, I've never done any studies with the mitochondria or the oxidative stress, but I'm always interested to, to read people's paper and talk to them at MECFS because it agrees with the patient perspective. Um, it matches what could be a possible cause of their symptom. And again, if we understand the cause, hopefully we can get at a solution. You guys, while we take a break, I will hang out right here if you want to talk um, more. Right, Elizabeth, and then until 3 p.m.